Hi, it's Darren Paul of Focus Soups. Firstly, huge thank you for clicking on this video. This is part one of a brilliant interview that we did with um, with Paul Cantwell, who, firstly, I want to apologise to Paul for this taking so long. Um, you shouldn't have had to wait for it to take this long. I'll be perfectly honest with you. It's all it's my fault, and I've just had a mental block when it comes to these. The reason I apologise is because these are great stories and I've thought about how to make it work so we're going to split it into two part one which is this video you're watching now this is more to do with Paul's playing career and again some of the stories you're gonna love they're I mean they're not unbelievable but I mean they're a bit unbelievable they're awesome so really excited to share these with you and then in a few days time we're gonna have part two which is focused more on Paul's development as a as a coach how it's taken him around the world and where it's taken him today and in the future. So I hope you enjoy. Um, I think that we've got some really great stories told by Paul. It's taken too long for them to come to the service and I apologise for that. I hope you enjoy it. I hope um, if you have enjoyed it, make sure firstly you tell Paul on social media, you like our videos, subscribe and share and just a huge thank you to all the time that people put in to enjoying and supporting our content really genuinely means a lot so huge thank you and paul a massive apology hello and welcome to focus soups with kaz and daz we've got another exciting interview to bring you for the women's basketball and today we've got with us Paul Cantwell, who is the Director of Coaching for the Manchester Mystics in the Women's Elite Academy Basketball League. Paul's played professionally here in the UK and overseas. He's coached here and overseas, does a lot of player development work with players, and um, he's going to just talk us through his basketball journey. Um, so we're very excited to have him with us today. Now. So, hi, Paul. Um, great hey. to have you with us. How are you doing hey, today? Guys. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity for coming on. I know we've been trying to get this date together a while. Uh, <laughs> You know, we have finally got in now. Um, you guys are doing a great job, and I appreciate of you know taking your time up to to bring me on and talk everything basketball. That's great, thank you. Yeah, we're really pleased to have you here. So let's just jump into it, um, and let's get started from the beginning. So basketball, how did how did it come into your life? Was it through school, family? Uh, what, what well, you know, it, it was re really interesting. <laughs> well, no, it's just really weird to be fair. It was I was a footballer at first, like most kids. You know, growing up, I was a footballer, a uh, typical tall kid. You know, uh, played football, and then my next door neighbour, um, that they had uh, a son who was coaching basketball, playing basketball, and just said, you know, would he be interested in coming down sometime? So I was really heavy into the football, never really played basketball. I went to the Reddish Vale Basketball Centre, which is the school I ended up going to, high school. Um, so I went, went there as a kid, and I was terrible. I was a really <laughs> bad player to start with. Like I was just, I just couldn't catch, couldn't play. Uh, but I got into it like you all do. You know, my football was on a Sunday, basketball was on a Saturday, so I could do both. Uh, about, I'd say about two years later, it comes to that point like it does crossroads. Football changed to Saturday, pick a sport. You know, uh, which still to this day, uh, my mum really likes. Um, it basically happened was she said, sat me down, which would you like to do? I straight away, I just turned around and was like, okay, I want to do basketball because I hate the outdoors. <laughs> so that's literally how it was. I hate the outdoors. I said, okay, I, I, I walk into my basketball. My mum was delighted. I have no idea to say why I picked basketball stuff because I was, again, I was not good at it compared to football. Uh, but I did. And that just kind of started from there. Started snowballing from there. Uh, I just kind of working my way up the ranks. You know, I, I started a youth team. Um, uh, who was away? I think I was with. <laughs> Probably just like a little reddish team to start with. Um, my old man, my stepdad got involved with coaching. And I just started to grow through the game and I was always the youngest on my team. Um, so it was always pretty good. You know, I always got to play a year above myself. Um, and then we just, you know, I, as you do, you play more and more basketball. I started to do some national league camps. Uh, we see a better standard. Um, and then it probably got to, I want to say about 13 years old, 12 to 13. And then I started to get asked to play national league. Um, and ironically, because uh, I was becoming a quite a good player then, didn't pick Stockport originally. I went and played for Tameside, which my assistant coach now was my head coach then. So wow. who coaches with me now was my head coach then. So, yeah, it's a full circle, which is pretty cool. Uh, but, yeah, I went to Tameside, um, played there for 
about two years, I uh, started to get some England interest. Um, and then from there, I got asked to go to Manchester Magic. I said, sorry, before teams, I had one year at Stockport, one year at Stockport. And then I got scouted for team side, did the team side for two years. And then Joe Farber and Samit asked me to come uh, across to Manchester Magic and play. Uh, which is a big shock because I was about uh, at 14. I was tall. I was like 5'10", 5'11", nearly 6 foot. I always played as a big man, even at a young age back then. You know, you had that. If you're tall, you stand there. You know, yeah. <laughs> you get it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and then uh, from there, uh, I went to, you know, Manchester Magic and Samit and Joe, you know, really liked the way I played. I could pass. I could see the game. So Samit was like, listen, you have to play as a point guard. And I was like, what does that mean dribbling the basketball full court and he was like yeah that's what I would like you to do and I was like yeah but I don't want to do that I don't want to do anything you're saying I want to do the opposite of that so I'm dribbling the ball backwards down the court you know to start off with um, and it was a whole new world to me like you know going from that even though we, we you know under 14s that year team side we actually knocked out Manchester Magic when I played there we beat right. them and we went, went to the final fours and I think we play I think we got beat off I want to say NASA or someone like that and um, we come third that year. First time I think Thames had ever made the final four. I said I jumped ship o- over to Magic, as they say. And then uh, that world was different. You know, I had Joe Forber, Graham Williams, which everyone knows, you know, we had them. And this level of just at that age, this training was like, blew my mind. You know, I, I, it was so hard to really comprehend it. Um, but, you know, as I was growing up, my, my family always told me, you know, listen, just, just stick it out. Um, you know, ride it out. And I just kind of found my, my, my feet, you know, uh, the coaching was really patient with me. And I just started to understand the game a lot more. And I just kept moving through the ranks. I, you know, the, I got I kind of got better and better, changed positions. And then they started to say to me, you know, you can play above. So I started playing up age groups with different players. Uh, and then some of the players who I was still playing at Reddish with, like Recreation and Ball Hall, they had been scouted at Magic. So we started to have a nice little kind of click of players who were hanging about. Um, so then, yeah, I played there for two and a half seasons. And then, unfortunately, I got I got an illness um, and I couldn't play for a year. I had to have a year out. So this was probably when I was, I want to say 16, you know, you know, probably That's about 16. To yeah, re- stop re- really tough. Something. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was a big shock to me as well because I think you know I was right on the brink. I was I was one of the talented players. I think at the time, you know, we had really good battles. It was us, Derby, um, Sheffield and at the time. Sheffield's team who played against us was Nigel Van Oostrom. Um and I remember his little brother, um, Devon, who was about 13, 14 at the time. I, mean, I still have this memory of playing them. Um, <laughs> I remember getting a rebound and like kept knocking Devon over because he was only a little kid playing up. And now I look full circle. I think, well, he's gone on to do pretty well. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I think you know, that didn't pan out quite well for me as I thought <laughs> I would have done, you know, back then. Uh, but we had, we had Mikey Mang and Tom Pereira. We had Josh Horton played on my team with me. Uh, ben Thomas had a stint, stint playing with us, you know. So there's quite a few people who've been around the game a lot. Um, we I got to play up a few age groups, like I said, with like Menelik Watson, Tom Fox, uh, Ben Daniels. There was a lot of good players, you know, and they, they've all, all a winning pedigree as well. You know, they 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 had not uh, lost for a long time. And I remember my first, I think going into my second season under 16s, we had Sheffield first game, our rivals. And I remember Joe Farber saying, under 16s, we've not lost for something like 102 games consecutively. <laughs> so we were like, okay, well, we're in Manchester Magic at hot home, Sheffield. Yeah, we lost. We lost. <laughs> so as you can imagine, after the game, we went in and Joe Farber just went, Thanks for breaking my record. You can get changed. And I was like, oh, no. I was like, all I could think was practice this week is going to be dreadful. Like, <laughs> And it was. It was. Uh, but they were all learning curves. You know, you, you have to go yeah. through that, you know. And that kind of sinks, uh, sat in with me of that type of standard. You know, um, listen, you know, you, you have done that. That's the record gone because of you kind of guys. What are you going to do about it? You know, so that was interesting. And then that season when uh, we got knocked out in the quarterfinals, I think of, against Solent, went down to Solent, which was miserable. They made they did a tip off at twelve o'clock, so we had to set up at five in the morning. Um, yeah, we were like, can you change it? And it was it was the weirdest story. We played them, and on their website at the time they had to the fans, everyone bring a musical instrument. 
we didn't take much notice of that, you know, 15, 16 year old kids. We got there. And this was the first kind of, because they knew obviously oh, it's magic coming down, whatever we're playing. Literally, we, we, jump ball happened. We won it. Every single person, instrument out, just started banging. The noise. So all those trying to call plays or communicate, dead. The minute they got the ball, silent. And I was like, oh, this is not going to be good. <laughs> not going to be good, this. Right? And even some guy, the triangle, just bashing it. I'm going, what's going What are we doing here? And we lost by four, I think, in the end, actually. Oh. But yeah, which was not not good. And I said the year after, unfortunately, I had um, I got an illness and then I had a year out, which was really tough because it's my GCSE year. Um, the, the, obviously, I was playing sport at school still, but I wasn't really allowed to, to play at Magic. Um, so it was just really tough, a, a tough year, because that's the age where I think I was peaking as well, you know, in, in, in youth basketball. Yeah. Um, and it was really, really hard. And then I had a, about, well, yeah, about, probably about 11 months out, I come back and then Magic had gone a different way. They had played a lot of youth up and then I, I'd gone through a training camp, thought my spot was still secure. Typical, you know, I was a bit out of shape like you would be. And then I got cut. Samit, you know, Samit said, you know, we're going to go a different way. Uh, and that was the first real time I've always, I really experienced you're not playing. I've always been kind of one of the better players on the team or the best player on the team was, you know, I was top two on that team. Uh, and I didn't think a lot would change in the space of 11 months. You know, you don't, as a kid particularly, you just think you'll slot right back in, job done. And they just said, no, different direction. Um, and that, yeah, that really, really set me back. You know, I because I've been through a lot anyway and I was very much like, right, wow, you know, what, what do we do? You know, I was so I wanted to go to the States or watch play, you know, at a higher level. I wanted to be at Magic. I still had all these plans, even though I had time out. You know, I still wanted to have a you know, I get back in shape. Gone. And it was it was really, really hard. You know, I didn't know what to do. So I went back to um my old roots. I went back to Stockport. Uh, like obviously, you know, when I first started, I went, went back to Stockport. And again, my assistant coach was with me now. He was then coaching Stockport now. Um, so I, I, and they were all my friends who went to school. We won a national title, I think, in year ten or eleven at Greenwich Vale, uh, and they were all my friends. They were all playing at Stockport, so I went back there. And um, ironically, we played Magic in the first game of the season about six weeks later, and then Joe and Samit come and ask me back. <laughs> I said, Put him there. So I just thought, me being me, I just turned around and said, No, I'm going to stick where I am now. You know, I said, I'm not going to do that. They took me back in. I'm not that type of person, you know. It, that's just, you know, how I am. Um, and we end up getting, I think, to the quarters and we played Magic and the Beatles. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, and that was that was kind of that journey. And that was my year uh, where I went to Marple College, left British Vale, went to Marple College and did a year there. And then, uh, yeah, played with Stockport. Then I was looking at my options. You know, do we do two years in England? You know, what, what do I do? Uh, my next step. So I was doing my year at Marple College, playing at Stockport, working out, you know, um, I'd gone to America for six weeks with that Stockport team as well, with Dave Meaden. I uh, did six weeks in the summer there, really enjoyed my time there. I had a couple of offers as well, uh, but unfortunately, financially, I couldn't afford them. They weren't full rides at the time. Yeah. So I couldn't, I couldn't afford those type of situations. Uh, come home. Um, and then, well, I said, actually, like I, I was going through that process with Marple and Stockport. And then Tom Stansfield, who you guys know, he was in France at 22 Foot Academy. He had messaged me and talked to me about, um, about you know, coming over here. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, at the same time as well, I was playing Division 3 for Stockport, uh, men's team. So I was really young, still playing Division 3, starting guard there. And I was talking to Matt Newby as well at the time, who was at Leeds, about potentially going there. Um, so that was an interesting conversation. So I had different options looking around, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Tom got in contact with me about going to France and playing in France at 22 Foot Academy. Um, and then, yeah, we, we just kind of made things work from there and I ended up there. That was So that was kind of my youth part of development from going from Stockport to Tameside to Magic to going through the system um, to then getting caught to then kind of going back to where it all began, as they say. And it sounds like one of those, you know, romance novels, you know, you kind of do your thing, but it's just how it panned out for me, you yeah. know. And luckily, I always had good ties with everyone in the kind of the basketball community. Uh, I always made time for people. Um, and it, yeah, I went back there. And then, yeah, when I got there, I went to, to France. And that's where that next journey began.
And is that something that had always been kind of a goal that you wanted to do? You wanted to be able to either go overseas or play here professionally? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my thing. I always wanted to go overseas. I always wanted to uh, travel. Uh, my sister, she was not, she wasn't into sport as, as such, but she left home at like eighteen to to travel and, and be a rep and do stuff. And our family always advocated, you know, whatever opportunity comes up, try and take it and gain as much experience as you can. So that was definitely something we were, you know, we we were looking at. Uh, I was looking at doing, uh, and I didn't know how this was going to come about. You know, how it was going to work. I'd sat down with my family, spoke about, you know, the financial. Uh, side of things, how this might work. Um, this Mike Rawson, this guy who owned this academy, uh, had phoned other coaches in England, to be fair, to ask about me. Um, and then they said, you know, we'd like you to come. Um, so, yeah, that, and that was my first year at college. So I had to take my college work with me from, for my second year, uh, which didn't go too well, as you can imagine. Um, but, yeah, I, and I, w- I went to France. You know, t- Tom was there, uh, which which made the first bit of transition a little bit easier. And what's that like going over to just another country at such a young age and just like you say, having to juggle schoolwork and then play in the academy? Um, I think for me, <laughs> I think it's one of those, oh, you know, the internet does a lot of things for you. And I think it's, um, I had this picture in my head of how this is going to work, how this is going to be, um, how this is going to look. Uh, <laughs> like you do in my head, I had, you know, in my head, I had a facility that looked like Lakers. I thought I was going to be having ice baths, you know, 14 different strengths coaches. I had all these, you know, you know, things in your head. And then when we got there, we were in the, you know, landed, got picked up. It's like a two and a half hour drive. We were in like, it, basically it was a big converted, uh, like, uh, say, like a farm field converted. It was massive. Um, and it was gorgeous, don't get me wrong. It was beautiful where it was, but it was very isolated. We had an outside basketball court. Uh, we had a big, massive house where all the players stayed. We had a kitchen area where the coaches stayed. Um, and it was a bit of a shock. And I went in and this, uh, you know, I looked at this strip and conditioning room and it was the size of my front room. And I was a bit like, all oh, right, so there's not, okay, this is unusual. And then, you know, I thought it was going to be like I've seen, you know, I looked at, you know, when, before I went there, I, 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 I like Duke, you know, basketball. So I was thinking of their facilities. And when I got here, it was like, it was not that. It was, you know, the the opposite. Um, and it was really strange because we got there, and I've always been quite, a, you know, a confident, a confident person. I'm very outgoing, like to talk to people. And when I got there, I really, and I've always said I was always quite a talented player. But when I got there, I did really. It kind of took me a big, big step back for me. And this is what I always try and give my experiences to players, um, top ones or people coming up. You know, it's it's not it's not as easy as you think it is. You know, and there's so much that goes into it. Uh, and so much perse- perseverance. And when I got there, luckily I knew Tom. But when I got there, you know, there was, there was probably about 32 players, you know, from, and you're talking that there's three teams, you know, or two teams played at the time. So, and I got there and I think there was only something like six bigs. So there's 20, you know, 26 guards. Everyone's going over there to try and find a professional job or, you know, try and go to the States from there. Uh, and you've got a, such a mix amount of people. I think there was 12 people from the UK, he had uh, people from Iran, America, Spain, you know, Italy. Such a wide um, variety, a diverse group. And you're kind of going, right, okay, you, you have to kind of find yourself again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you feel like you know yourself. Then you go into that environment. Then you go, maybe I don't know anything about me. <laughs> this, this, is, <laughs> this is not making me comfortable, you know. Uh, so I said I was lucky to have Tom there just to bounce with someone, but he had his own stuff to do. Yeah. Uh, and I remember getting there, trying to get settled in, meeting people. Some people were really welcoming, some people were not. And I remember my first day at practice, we got up at about half five, minibus for six. New kid on the block, so I was like, I'll see how everyone loads in the minibuses, how we get to practice. Tra- going to get in the minibus, and there was a there was a player there, and I said, oh, can, you know, can I jump in? He was like, no, you go in the other car straight away. Just like, you're not coming in this bus. And I felt because it, it, I was another guard, they were angry that more guards were coming in. They've already probably been there, you know, two, three months. They've kind of established themselves probably tired through training because I'll, I'll go into that it was it was, you know, it was brutal it was like a military camp um but I was just like right I went to the next minibus no you're not coming in this one ended up cramped in this little 1960s car like with five other players going well, okay well this is not again how I envisioned any of this like I envisioned you know a coach with TVs and maybe a sauna on you know a steam I, I, you know you put this <laughs> wild thing Went down the road and then, you know, we uh, we go to this facility and it's, it's a regular, it's a nice facility, it's a regular facility. 
and that's the first time I really got to know my coaches. Uh, they were, I think they run European Academy still now. There were Serjan, Serjan and Goran Premovic, uh, Serbian coaches. Um, they were tough. And I mean, so they were coming first day, what position do you play? I was like, I'll play one, two or three. No, what position do you play? I was like, at this point, I'm like, Centre back. I don't. I'm saying <laughs> random things. I'm. I'm like. I'm, I don't know. I'm panicking now. I'm like. I'm. I'm a point guard. You know what? what from what I know of. Uh, right. Okay. We'll go there. And this. This. You. Know, you're gonna need to fit in. Going through training. Training was cool. First day. You know. You joined a bit of the scrimmage again. Just finding your feet. Um. But then I realised as we started going through the process, how they coach. You know, they were. When I say like military, it was. It was brutal at times to the point where. You know, if we didn't complete a drill, we'd have to do that drill for the two hours. You know, wow. that could be a that could be a three man weave. You know, make fifty shots, and you know, if one person missed, we start again. We start again, and it wouldn't be like, okay, you know, let's move on. And they were very, very into conditioning. I was never the quickest player, um, but you know, they, they were so into conditioning. But the way they kind of talked, the way they were aggressive, and, and one quote I still tell people, what what you know, stuck in my head. We were exhausted at one point, just. The constant training, the travelling, food wasn't great. There was other aspects to it. Um, he pulls in. He was like, "You guys, you you soft. You know, you're really, really soft." He was like, um, uh, "In Serbia, we run with wolves." And I was like, I'm, "I'm from Manchester. I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that that quote means to me. I've never seen a wolf. I don't know what that means." Uh, and they would just say stuff like this, and they'd put us through things. Uh, like, for instance, we got beat off a of protein. Thinking NM2, or, yeah, NM2 team, they were top of leagues. So they're on good money, you know. We're a bunch of kids. We get beat, something like 92, 70. We get back at two in the morning, half one, two in the morning. He bangs us up at quarter past five with a drum. Bang, bang, bang. Makes us run eight miles in snow. Oh. No. We get back, we get back, then we have to walk to practice, which took us about an hour and a half in the snow. Then he punished us for two and a half hours and then made us walk back. So you're looking about seven hours. At any point, are you thinking, have I made the right decision here? Or oh, he you... has constantly, you know, <laughs> from, from you know, from situations like that, from not being picked in games, for not getting game time. And it wears on you as a kid, you know, like especially when you've been a starter, a player, and then they've picked their favourites, you know, different players. And you're trying to work that out yourself. Because I've never been in that position where I've not played. So yeah. I've never, you know, and that was just the way it fell for me in my, my youth career. Uh, but it was it was really challenging. And then we had like the Americans come in, and they they've already either been playing pro and coming here as a gap stop, or they're coming straight from college, you know. And when you start seeing them, that knocks your confidence. Even though you could be eighteen and they could be twenty five, you start going, "I'm miles away," you know. And it wears it really really wears you down over time. But I've met uh, you know I still speak to people like Jermaine Lang at Bradford. I don't know if he plays D1 at Bradford. He was one of my roommates. Dwight Robinson was a roommate of mine. Um, there's just, there was so so many people uh, who I met along the way. Uh, Matt Morris was an American player there. He's the one who hired me to be a coach in America later on. So I built all these relationships with people. Uh, and I think that's what kept me going. And I think there was there was 46 players went through the academy. Three of us survived and three of us got contracts. Wow. But honestly, it was it was probably the hardest. I want to say I went there for ten months, come home for two months, and then went back because I'd you have your break. The hardest thing I have ever, ever, ever been through. Not just physically, the mental side. You get up, you go training, you come back, you shower, you eat, you sleep, you up, you train, and you're in your bedroom with your roommates. And we're in the middle of a farmland, so there's not really anywhere to go. You nip to the shop once a week, um, and obviously, if you're battling with people at practice, then you've got to live with them. You know, um, and it's extremely difficult. And obviously, as you can imagine, a load of males in the house, tempers flare. Um, they think they're better than you. You think you're better than them. Then we, when you're there as well, you get you can get loaned out to like teams who aren't professional. I got loaned out to a team. And the deal is like after the game, they buy you food and stuff. And I thought that was a great learning curve. And what I probably needed just for mental health side to be away from all the guys. Yeah. You know, you, you train every day with them. You live every day with them. Uh, you can't go anywhere. You play with him on the team. So me going up there, I, you know, I got to be around, you know, a different culture. You know, I got to be around that, which was, um, which was for me was was unbelievable. And then it, I, I felt like I got to come into my own again. You know, I got to have that break again. Um, and it was weird that you know I, I started to get in shape. And I remember phoning my mum 
um, probably about way about seven months in, six months in, said, "You need to get me a flight. I'm done." I said, "I can't do this anymore." I said, and she went, "What are you going to do when you come home?" And I went, well, "I don't know." And she went, "Exactly." She went, "Just keep grinding." And at that point, I'm like, "You don't understand what we're going through now." You know, I said, "This coach at one point we had 30 players. We had five fit, we had 25 injured. You couldn't even. That's how and we had to go to the owner and say." I was I was the youngest vice captain there. There was three captains. Then they put me as a vice captain. I don't know why, uh, but it did. And I think just I, I could talk to the coaches and you know the head guy because I don't know. Just probably being from Manchester, Stockport kids, you know, you just kind of you build that rapport with people. And um, I remember going to Mike and going, Mike, we've got five fit players. We can't even we can't even run a game. And we were icing. We had a pool next to our basketball court. And in summer, this sounds all that nice, but in winter, you can't really use it. In winter, we'd smash through the pool and we used to have our ice bath in that just because that's how we needed our legs to recover that quickly. And we'd be, it'd be snowing, minus 14, towel around you, in the pool. And we had this guy called Brendan Metler, played for the South African national team, and he's the most strongest human being. I've ever, I remember running into him at practice and thinking, he's got to be an Avenger or something. <laughs> he's got to have something going on because I can't get past him. And he, were, you know, he kind of took me under his wing and he was a really good dude. And I got to understand kind of like where he was from, his upbringing to mine. And I remember there was him and a guy called uh, Manny. He was from Nigeria. And we went to an away game. This is when you know where you're kind of privileged. Went to an away game and we played this team and we beat them. And in the middle of winter, they decided not to put the heating on in our changing rooms. So we had cold showers. Well, I can't jump in. I'm struggling with this cold shower situation. It is freezing. Manny and Brendan jump in and go, this is normal to us, you guys. This, and I'm going, yeah, we're really privileged. Like, I'm gonna be honest, we're really soft compared to you guys. You guys are, you guys are tough. We're not like built like that, built like you. Uh, the luxury. You know, that's it, you know. And the, the, you know, I learned so much from those older guys, the American guys coming, Charles Stone, Rick Leisure, uh, Matt Morris. Um, these guys come in and they kind of then showed me how to like really work and what that level was. These Americans coming in because. They just knew how to do everything correctly, you know, because they've been at D1, D2, D3 colleges. This um, Charles had just been playing in Denmark professionally. Um, and I really I really clicked with them, you know. I really clicked with the older crowd in, in, in that group. Um, I don't know why I just did. I, you know, I think that's because, like I said to you guys earlier, I've always played up and been around older people. I grew up around older people. Uh, I really clicked with them. And uh, I just started to flow with them more. And then as time went on, training obviously become more and more brutal. A lot of people decided just to go home, just leave. You know, a uh, kid called Dean Williams was there, Renarco from, from England, uh, and Mac Main from England. There was a ton of players. Uh, and because it just was at that point, it, it, at times it was military. And then Mike ended up, I think, firing or letting them go. And then Matt Morris, who obviously was on our t- uh, um, one of the American players, decided to become a coach. His wife had moved with him. He had been playing pro a bit. Uh, and he was he was the, honestly the best shooter I've ever seen. We played, uh, he first come in and Mike, the owner, was bigging him up. And he's done that with a few players and they've come in and have been like, yeah, no, he's not very good at basketball. But you said, Matt come in, he come from Clemson D1, he's tall, white guy, about 6'6", six, six, long hair, like a surfer, didn't have an ounce of muscle on him, just a straight line human. Uh, ran as slow as me, so I'm sat there going, oh, okay, he might be at 12 out of 14 threes the first game. Just <laughs> not out, not... I had 16 assists in that game. <laughs> never, never, never looked so good player. And the Americans, <laughs> we had three Americans, Brendan, the South African national player with me, and all they had to do was pass one of them the ball. And that's all. I, all... I looked really good because I just go like that. And every time they shot, it went in. So I was like, oh, brilliant game tape for me. Um, but when I saw that game, and I thought, okay, right, well, that's D1. I get it. That's and I, 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 and Matt didn't start till his fourth year and only got 20 minutes. So you got to think, what are those players who are going to the NBA like? Yeah. That's, and that's where I, I, stuff started to fit into place to me going, okay, yeah, I am still, even though I'm probably one of the better players at the academy by this time, I'm still quite a way off here. Um, do you think sometimes that's something that maybe kids, might miss they might not quite realize how big the gap is and that, that that's the key and that's what i was saying to before you know we'll get into the mystics thing later about when they want to try and jump up levels and sometimes that can just be even though it can be good for development 
it can destroy confidence. Mm. And it and it can really go right. Okay, now we're as a player, and some players like myself, I always took it as like a challenge. Okay, right, I've got to then I've got to do something different here, whatever that will be. You know, however that will look. Some players go some because some say it's just insecurity. Well, no, you know, it's not my fault. It's this, or some players just go, I don't want any part of that now. You know, I don't want to work that hard, you know, and I've always prided myself on that work, you know, that work ethic. You know, when I was at Magic, you know, we trained five nights a week, four hours, played three games on the weekend. Then I'd sit, watch game tape. Then at school, I'd go before school to practice, lunchtime practice. Then that. So I already knew my work ethic and how I work. But when I got to France, I realised there was still another level. And I think that's what really kind of I was like, right, OK, because uh, we were already going through this military bit with these Serbian coaches, which I didn't really agree with. But what, what can you do? You know, you're, you're just a player. But then when I saw how the Americans train smart with that, efficiently with that, because sometimes I'm coming in, I'm just running around cold and shooting the basketball as quick as I can. Matt's coming to me and go, do you even shoot from there in a game? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'd pass you the ball for a start, so I don't get many shots. But, <laughs> you know, what, what, when I do, uh, I don't know. And he was like, what are your game shots? So, well, you know, I play a lot of pick and roll. I like to get to the middle. I like to float. I like to catch, shoot the three. And he went, but you've not shot any of them shots yet. And I was like, oh, yeah, good point. You know, and that's those little things yeah. I started to write down and add up and think, OK. He'd come in and he'd, he'd have like 34 minutes on the clock. And that's all he'd practice for. Those 34 minutes were the only shots he would shoot in the game at pace and I thought oh that's training smart I thought training smart was being in there for three hours you know you hear the you know you hear the stories about athletes they're in there six hours right well I'll do that then and I realized well maybe that's not what I need you know you need to get the efficiency out of it and and that and that again was the next learning part of of my playing career you know it was okay I know how to train hard I've always trained hard. I know I can see things happening. I'm doing that. But I'm a training smart. I'm a training efficiently. You know, uh, what does that look like as well? You know, because people, you hear coaches and players say these words. And I'm, you know, but half of them don't know what that means. You know, you can say to it, you know, are you taking your game shots? So some people go, I don't even know what that means. You know, I thought a game shot's just a shot. But then you find out, you know, who you are as a player. And that, again, was the next step for me. And then ironically, I said, their the coaches got um, got let go. And then Matt Morris got asked to become head coach with Charles Stone as assistant. So they went from playing on my team to now coaching me. And this is the first time I've had, a, in the same season, such a contrast in coaching. So I've gone from this very disciplined, fundamental, which it has its purpose. We're in the, I was playing the best shape I've ever been, the sorest I've ever been as a human being. <laughs> uh, fundamentally, I've probably the best I've ever been, even though I went through the magic program and stuff. Um, they like said, Sir John would make us do stuff like Paul. You can't move this drill until you've made forty bank shots from this side, forty from that, that type of stuff. I'd be like, and it wasn't even like a good training session. It'd be two dribbles on the left hand, jump stop, shoot, and you're thinking, I'm playing against pros. Why am I doing this? Yeah, but it had its purpose, you know, which you only see when you're going back. Yes, we should have done a lot more diverse training, but I got that side. Now Matt comes in, American. D1. Charles played Division 3, had to do Division 1 offers, but watched go D3 because of his academics. Um, he was an All-American um, from uh, of, uh, Division 3, uh, lead rebounder in his division, uh, played a Princeton offense, who understood the game really well. Uh, tactically, it was really good. They come out from a different approach. And I think because they'd been in the program with those coaches as well, they were like, well, we're not going to coach like that anyway because of it's too much. But also, they wanted to coach all the tactics about basketball. You know, the, and I, that's why I felt quite lucky where I could have left before they took over, so I just got the discipline side, but I stuck it out, and now I've got this, okay, this tactical side where, you know, we're playing smart, you know, we're looking at offences, defences, uh, they're working on my game, what they believe was going to suit me, not suit just the team, you know. Um, so many, and then... Again, efficient training. You know, if we got beat, they didn't wake us up at five to run. They'd be like, okay, listen, lie until 10, but listen, we're going to have to two and a half hour hard practice to correct our mistakes. We were like, fine, just let us sleep. You know, let us just get some energy back before we go again. Um, and that's, again, now uh, that's what I say to my coaches and people of the past. These little experiences kind of helped me along the way now as a player than now as a coach. Yeah. You know, because I look back and go, I'm never going to do that. You know, I'm not going to make for a start. You know, I, I try and do that thing where um, I'm going to I'm going to teach you. I'll, I'll not teach you anything I've not done. 
okay, or not willing to do. Well, I'm not willing to run eight miles of snow now, Kaz. I'm not willing to do that anymore. So I'm not going to make anyone do that now because I'm not willing to do it myself, okay? Uh, but it's, again, you know, I said, adding it all together. And it, I said, it's funny because when you're growing up, when you're young and you're going through these experiences, you don't realise what you're taking in. You really don't. It's just, it's it's kind of like a, a it goes so quick, it's a blur. You know, you try and take things in, you try, but you're going through the motions as a player. You know, you, you don't see it from a coach's side because you don't want to as a player. You know, you don't. So you go through it and then you hit a point where you kind of sit and you look back and you go, ah, it did sink in. <laughs> but yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, so that wasn't useless for me. Um, so yeah, that, that was good. And then we, we ended up, I think so we only finished with three or four players, which was, you think about it, you know, probably over 40, 45 players maybe have been. The way me, Daniel Mackham, and David Seremet. David Seremet still plays in the south of France for a team. Daniel Mackham ended up getting a French girlfriend, and um, he played for a team. Then did photography. Now I think he's lives in Toulouse, and obviously I'm back in the UK. Uh, but I still talk to them too. Um, Matt Morris, obviously, uh, as we move on to our next bit, still top top. I was chatting to him the other night actually. Uh, he's actually recruited a lot of our players for Magic now, as well. Oh, that's that's good. Wow. So yeah, so, we're, we're you know, all, all connected, all yeah. connected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, which is quite a way, you know. Again, didn't ever plan this to happen. This was not in my plan whatsoever. <laughs> um, but yeah, after, and then academy, academy closed down. For uh, it was poorly ran in the end uh, by Mike, and there was a lot of other problems with that. I went home. Uh, yeah, I had interest of teams in France because the owner had problems. He couldn't sort my license. Now he was my agent at the time as well. Um, and he was trying to get me a deal with Adidas at the time. He met, he, that went down the pan. And then I had to come home. He didn't move my license, I think, from a C to a D, I think it was in Europe. Come home. So then I went to Stockport uh, with, I said, Aki now, David Atkinson, who's my assistant yeah. now. I was in Division 3 and they were paying me in Division 3, paying me a lot of money uh, to play there. Um, so I was like, OK, I'll just, for the time being, I'll do this so I can look at my options again. About four months into the season, we were Josh Orton was playing me. I think we were thirteen and zero, knocked out. We'd beat Manchester Magic D one in two preseason games. We were loaded for a D three team. It was, I mean, really loaded. And after four months, we just folded financially, probably because they were paying me. So <laughs> that probably didn't help. Uh, but we folded. Then I um, that season was done, and then I had. Then that's when David Seremet, who was at the academy with phoned me he had left the team and that team because i had played against them and with them uh, in scrimmages said they wanted to sign me and um, so it, i was really fortunate i said yeah okay it made it made it happen uh, a team called colorac in ajan so literally it was only where we were based anyway in france it was probably only about 45 minutes away so i was pretty used to that area anyway um and it, i thought great i just get myself through the door you know nm3 you just get, get myself through the door um, went there and that was again a really really unusual experience so I got there and I said I would live with a family uh, and the the president of the club Fred and his wife Mimi who are just a, a beautiful people just the souls the energy everything about them it's just you know they were so good and they had two sons Gaton and a, a Marcus who both played there and Marcus played on my team, Gaton played on another team. But I got there living with his family. So Fred and Mimi are parents of the house, but they work in Paris a lot. But he's a, he runs our club in the south. Get there, I get introduced, uh, trying to work my, my way in. One of the things I wanted to live with the family as well was I wanted to try and learn a bit of French. Uh, because I don't speak English that well, to be fair, but I wanted to try and you know, learn this language. And I wanted to integrate, because I've been in academy and I've been isolated with just these same people. I wanted to become part of a community again. You know, I wanted to, you know, see what the city's like, nightlife's like, people, you know, culture. Uh, I think it's good for a player anyway uh, to do that. And I think, you know, if you want to make a career out of it, I think the best way is just always be, be on good terms with everybody. You know, yeah. be on good terms with everybody and try and immerse yourself with people. And if you want to learn, that's the best way. Some players, and I know I've spoke to a lot of players, they go to Europe and they just, you know, they get given a flat, a car and they just stay in the flat and they wonder they go I don't like the season you're going to have good and bad seasons but if you're having a bad year but you can still 
immerse yourself in another culture, you can get through it. If you're isolated, it's a long, long season. Very, especially if you don't get along with the coach, etc. Uh, but yeah, I went there, met this coach called Christoph. I still talk to him now. Uh, he reminds me like a, a George Clooney esque guy. Just low, he's just suave. He's like a silver fox. He just he's so. And he again was a completely different coach I ever had. He was not not really a tactician, not a shouter. He was just arm round the uh, you know shoulder coach. You know, listen, Paul. How do you want to play? And I'm like, well, I want to take every shot. That's first and foremost. That's where I'm at. Uh, and, you know, I, he'd say to me, you know, how are you fitting in wise? Uh, the third day in, he invited me around to meet his wife. People had a barbecue at his house. Introduced me to, like, the accountants guy. You know, people who worked with him in the club. Um, and that was, uh, I thought that was really nice. And he was just, uh, again, you a lot of broken English. I had no French at this point. Uh, or any point, to be fair. But, yeah, I was... Trying to immerse myself with him. Uh, he was a really good dude, but the way he coached, again, he was very much... We did a lot of fitness stuff outside, which was hard. It was hot when I first got there pre-season. And then after that, he just coached a very kind of free, open way where he would always ask me, like, you know, what are you seeing? You know, and his first time, it was really where... You know, obviously, I know I played for good teams and coaches did talk to me, but he had really gone into depth of going, I want you to lead the team. This is what I think leadership looks like. What do you think it looks like? How do you think we should play? And for me, that was kind of a bit of a shock because I was like, uh, are you not going to tell me like how how to play? Um, and he just said, no, he was like, you know, we want, this is kind of the style I'd like, but, you know, I want you to feel comfortable. If I was having a bad game, he'd be like, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep being aggressive, keep playing, keep shooting the basketball. We need you to play well. Um, and that was, that, that was, that was, um, again, a weird way for me to, to have somebody treat me like that. You know, so I've gone from the Serbians who, made out like I was, you know, like I was working 23-hour days with them. Then I'd gone from the Americans were very, like, you know, um, kind of very passionate and very, you know, extend training efficient tactically. Then I've got this French coach who's very much like autonomy. How do you approach yeah. it? So I, I'm gaining these random kind of experience and still I'm not putting this all together in my head. I'm just like, okay, you know. Uh, and we had a really young team uh, and I was the highest paid player on the team uh, at the time. And we were playing, we were trying to find our feet. It was it was really where we had a one who was 32 years old, 30 years old, me at 21, then everyone else younger. And for a pro team, that's really young. Mm. Really young, you know. And we had a couple of good kids who did play for like the French national team, but they were they were uh, again younger experience. And it, it was like, right, Paul, here's the ball. You know, you lead. And I was a bit like, and, and you know what? I learned a lot. I at times I had a bad attitude with with the team. At times because I, 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 I always want a win. I want a win. And they, they have such a culture. Like, for instance, our court, basketball court, after training, we have a bar right there and players and everyone can drink for free. So I'm like, oh, great. But after practice, or after I lost, I don't really want that culture. I want us to make sure we're good. But no, they're like, oh, it's all right. It's okay. And I'm like, it's not okay. You know, I don't get why you... But they have this very, it's done with now, open culture, you know. Yeah. And for me, I couldn't grasp it at first. I'm, you know, after it, I'm having protein shakes, foam rolling out. There, you know, grabbing a quick beer, and I'm <laughs> like, "What's going on?" I love a beer myself, but I'm thinking, you know, what, what, what's go what's going on here? You know, uh, in terms of that, you know, how what we're we doing. Season went, and we started on fire. First game I played um, preseason, we played the team who's ranked number one, and I had 45 points and we beat them. Big crowd at home. It was a, a brilliant. Uh, and I thought, wow, you know, I've arrived. You know, this is yeah. in the pa in the paper, my picture on the paper, number seven, the American. I'm like, what? American? <laughs> and I realised what Andy Murray goes through. Whenever we won, I was American. Whenever we lost, I was English. And I was <laughs> like, okay, so I'll see how this is going. This is going. This is going to be like this. Uh, but this is where I really had to grow up, and I, I, this kind of really sat in with me deeply because I play, when we played well, uh, we had games like that fans you're doing the autographs you're doing that whole type of player experience thing which is great and i remember uh it was it was brutal actually uh we played this game we beat this team next game i think he had about 24 and we lost by a couple and then the game after this team we started our season they'd obviously been scouting they double teamed me on everything i had 16 points 
the two weeks before we had that big game, there was an there was a lady, an old lady there with um, her like grandkids signed the autographs and stuff. And this is where a new sport and stuff you go through. I remember playing this third game and walking out, and she was about ten feet away. She looked at me and spat at me. Oh, wow. and, and I remember it, and she said something in French. Uh, I'm guessing it wasn't very nice <laughs> as it was there. And that's when I realised, oh, okay. So when you play well, you're they a fan you. favourite. Yeah. If you don't play so well, and this and this is what I mean by this is what I this is when I realised what it meant by diehard fans. That's when I think the expression, you know, you always hear it growing up. They were diehard fan, and you go, okay, I don't know what that is. You know, I guess they buy the jersey. That's what I thought. That's what I meant, and I thought, right. And then in the back of the paper, number seven, is he going to be a flop on this website? Is he going to be this? And at twenty years old, twenty one, you know, you, you, I'm going, I don't get what's happening here. You know, um, another example, we played a game the week before, and I had something like thirty four. Played well, we won. Went to a restaurant, come in, didn't have to pay for any food. It was good, you know. I had a good time, you know, a bottle of wine. It was lovely. Next week, we got beat. They wouldn't let me in. Same restaurant. So, but you imagine a 20 year old boy going, I don't understand yeah. this process right now, yeah. you know. And and, then, and my coach would be like, You said you wanted to play pro. And I'm like, Well, that's not helping me either, is it? You're not really giving much to go off there, are you? You know, with this uh, at all. But that's, again, another experience going right. I understand when you look at these NBA players and the scrutiny they get, and it's dead easy to go online and do this and do, you know, and but when you actually immersed in it, and I was only at that level, do you know what I mean? So you can imagine as you go up, the the these the, the, the pressure coaches and players get. And that's a so young was, age as well to have to deal with. with I mean, it's, it's, a, it's hard to deal with anyway, I imagine, but like at 20, mm. 21. Exactly. And I, and I don't speak the language, so it's very hard with that. With my team, I was the only only import that year on my team. So everyone else was French. So even though they spoke good English um, and they made me feel welcome, when you want to try and offload stuff, I had nobody really to like talk to, you know, through that process. Uh, and I found that difficult, you know, you know, because obviously your family back home, people back home will always naturally support you. Yeah. You know, they'll keep doing, you're doing really well, you know, you keep, but you need somebody there, like in the trenches, as they say, with you to go, listen, we suck at the moment. Oh, we need to change something, you know. And it was very, very difficult. And the coach, to be fair, you know, he was top with, he was amazing with me, great dude. And unfortunately, halfway through the year, I think we were like six and six, and they let him go. Uh, and Fred, who actually was the GM of the club, ended up stepping in and coaching. Um, and he, you know, he did a decent job. And I think we finished, uh, you know, because we were so young, I think out of 12, we finished seventh, I think, something like that. But the ironic thing is, we'd beat the top three teams twice and lost to the bottom three teams twice. So I don't know how we, we did that. I don't know. Again, I, I think that youth age, young, we, you know, when we play these top teams, we play up for it. When you play bottom teams, that inexperience kicks in. You know, you we'll beat them anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And again, another learning curve. Uh, and then that year, I, I had a really, really, really good year. Uh, overall, uh, you finished top of the scoring. Um, loads of um, good news, uh, as in feedback for me. Uh, from there, the second year, again, I think the season season didn't go well that year at all. I think we ended up getting relegated. We lost budget. Um, changed coach again. Didn't go well. I started a good year. I had a really good year. Um, and then I started to get asked of teams of NM2 and NM1. Um, and that's you know that's where the, you know the better money comes in the big that's why I wanted to get to I wanted to go up the rankings because uh, we played N one teams in the cup and I was scoring heavily on them um, with regards to that and it again which is quite weird when, when I was at the academy I went to Limoges which is a pro A team I think it's still in pro A now pro A teams have to have an Espoir team so an under twenty one team and. That year at Harris Tournament, there was a guard called Stanley Johnson. The year before, played for Grand Canaria. When I was in France, then I went to play at Limoges. He was on that under-21 team. He'd moved there. So we knew each other played. And then after that, and this is where I knew something at the academy wasn't right. They asked me to sign for him. So I thought, well, this is massive for me. Under-21 Espoir, and I get to train with a pro A team. And this was when I was at the academy, so 18, 19. This is, this is, this is exactly, it kind of could be life-changing. My the guy who won the academy messed my license up, so couldn't so, play. Yeah, it, it couldn't go to them. Uh, so I was really, but I was naive. I just trusted him. 
and he, yeah. he, he come up he come up with an excuse and I was like okay maybe it's that later as you get a bit older I found out you know he had not done the paperwork correctly like cut corners so that was a big blow to me um and obviously now when I'm playing in France now playing pro I know a bit more about my license and imports and then I wanted to sign for another team um I think it was Papo who uh, the, the GB just played there, you know, the stadium yeah. in France. Oh, that's, yeah. the team I, that's the team I was going to hope to sign for. Uh, I wanted to sign for, they were in NM2 at the time, uh, NM2 or NM1. Um, couldn't get the deal over the line. Uh, I was representing myself as well. I didn't really know much about it, you know. My, my friend David was trying to help me. And then another team I went to sign for, I'd, I, I, I was, um, I'd verbally agreed with them. I'd come home. And then got an email to about two weeks later to come on for summer. About two weeks later, said, "Hi, Paul, give me a call." It was the GM name, I can't remember his name. Gave him a call. They'd gone in a different direction. Didn't want any imports that year. So again, now I'm back at home, which was a, which was a, a disaster for me, really. Uh, but going back, so going again, I can, sorry, I keep going back and forth. I was trying to time it all up. But when I was at the academy as well, um, I'd been offered uh, a place to play. And again, I didn't find out this this till later on. Uh, pro team. So when I was nineteen, it was only low low money point. NM three again. You know, low. It wasn't anything spectacular. Um, and Mike, who was representing me at the time, had gone behind my back and asked for more money, but I didn't ask that. And they said no. So I thought they just not come to an agreement. But if we just went off our agreement, You'd it would have been fine. It. But I got it, and I never wanted anything more. I just wanted to get my foot through the door, like every yeah. young player does. You know, and that's again that like when you start going into things like agency and stuff, you start to understand. You know, when people talk about stuff, you can understand why there's horror stories. Yes. You know, yeah, you really, really can. Again, I, I didn't know anything about this, uh, but yeah, this, this season happened in France. Two two years there, two great years. You know, with with, with that family uh, and that culture. That I think for me, the culture was the biggest thing, biggest shock. Uh, for instance, not how one how much they love the team how passionate these cities really, really are. So, for instance, on, on an away game, um, or any game, home and away, which I, don't, I didn't know, I know you do, you have to eat with the other team, which I never okay. knew you did good. So, you go away, uh, win or lose, you sit with the other team and they prepare a meal for you. Mm. Well, I, have no, I didn't have the best temper anyway, and I don't like losing. So, the last thing I wanted to do was break bread with somebody who I've just lost with. That took me a while to adjust. I'd sit at the old head, you know, took me a while. I had to grow up as well. I was being very immature with it at the time, you know. I was just I just didn't I was 20 years old. I'm like, why are we high chasing each other? We just lost. Yeah. Uh, and then at home we did the same thing. But on away games, sometimes we'll get back at three in the morning and we had like a an outhouse outside of our stadium. People, people who were part of the club, uh, volunteers would stay up and cook us food again. So we'd get there at three, three in the morning. We'd all stay up and have a couple of drinks and food till like six, seven in the morning religiously. I actually thought at first, again, I didn't like that because I was tired. But then I really grew to, to that's when I would start making changes going, you know what? I, I'm not going to change their culture, you know, yeah. so I have to adapt. I can, they've had this way of life for 20 years. You know, you can't, you don't come in there and try. So I started to embrace that. And I think the more I did that, I got more comfortable with it. And I can understand that. There's more things than was just basketball, because I've only been yeah. basketball, basketball, blah, blah, blah. and it, again that took uh, maturity, trying to learn, trying to go to understand that, uh, which which was massive. Uh, um, but anyway, so after those seasons, I come home, didn't get the teams in France I wanted to. I was really deflated, really gutted, and I thought I was the, I'm playing I'm the best player I've ever been. Uh, I'm, I'm scrimmaging in England with teams, and you know playing really, really, really well uh, against a lot of these teams. Signed with Giants. Uh, with Jeff and them, but that was a year where they were going through a big, big transition. With, yeah. with, had, we, had a, we had a stacked team, but we just couldn't put it together, you know. And I think it was a bit toxic, uh, you know, just, just kind of everything we had going on. And then this is where my injury started to, to occur, problematic. Um, about two months in, yeah, it was Christmas break, so I'd only been there two months. i uh, not really played for them uh, for whatever reason, you know, Jeff didn't want to play me, or the, the organisation was was doing what they were doing. And I was the new guy in the block again, so I, I got I kind of understood it a bit. And then we had the Christmas break. I come I come back after Christmas break, and I literally warming up, did a jump shot, and I had a pop in my calf, and I was like, okay, went to to run this burn. Never felt anything like it. 
uh, went to the went and uh, saw a physio. They were like, "You've got grade two tear in it." So I was like, "Where's it?" They were like, "Well, listen, you know, you have to be off your feet." So I was like, "Okay, well, as a player, you just you go right, okay, you know, you do yeah. your typical two two weeks and you crack on again." Two weeks later, um, come back on the court. Literally felt good for about two three minutes. Went to change pace. Boom, pop. Again, really bad this time to the point it was like it, it started to go black on my leg on the side of it and I was like oh no that season was just in and out of right after me that's where I started to work at Oldham yes because because now uh, unfortunately I'm not getting paid like I was in France you know you still have responsibilities you know Giants wasn't really getting much there uh, it just wasn't it just wasn't a good you know it fit for me uh, money wise I had to start making money I wanted to still train at the level I did so I was still trying to go to the gym, you know. I, I still even remember my friend was cleaning uh, at one of the ball halls. He was the cleaning there. I used to I used to turn up there at one in the morning just to train for like three four hours, and I'd go to the gym. Then I'd sleep. I still tried to keep a routine like I was still a pro athlete in France. You know my routine every day. Uh, what you try and do as a pro athlete and look after yourself. But now finance becomes a thing. You know, you go, well, we, you've got to pay for food. You've got to pay for this now. You've got to do this. Because you know in the past, you know, we don't get supported as athletes properly. Yeah. Or, or didn't, you know, particularly well. So that season becomes a write-off. I'm doing, I'm working at Oldham and I'm, uh, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go see a private, a, a private physio, private, a lower limb specialist at, at, at Alexander Hospital. He says, you need to be off your feet for about four months. So I said, well, I work full-time as a coach at Oldham. You know, I, I do a lot of other stuff. He was like, well, I'm just telling you, he said, unless it rips to a tier three, so then we operate or you have four or five months off. So I was like, so I had to just slowly, just, I was still doing bits on it, but it, it, it did start to heal a lot quicker than I thought it did. Doing a lot of stuff at Oldham in, in youth development, which I've never really done before, uh, but it was just something I got involved with and, and it kind of took off. And then Paul Middleton, who was actually, you know, he played at Manchester Magic. He, um, he had coached there. He was like, you know, one of like the third or fourth assistants with Summit and Joe and them when I was a kid. Now he was the head coach. You know, he had, he had seen me, messaged me, and he said, you know, he thought I'd become a, a top, top player in, in the country, one of the best guards, he thought. So then I re-signed with Magic. So it's kind of like a full circle again. I yeah. re-signed. Uh, I'm now a paid player. So I've gone from being a 14-year-old boy who didn't want to dribble a basketball to now the, the paid player, you know, there. Um, and we had a really good team. Me, Frank, Ellis Cooper. Ryan Lofik, and we had a good team, and you know, for two years we dominated. You know, that, that, was that, that division. Really, you you were you watched us, guys, did you? Daz, I don't know if you've seen it. You know, you you you, you guys had uh, might have caught the games and watched us. We had a stacked team. Um, and then unfortunately, my I started to get problems with my calves again. I tore my calf again, my right one. I had two months out, I come back, I tore my left one. The first practice back. Um, and then it, they both healed, and then I played three games. I uh, played three games uh, really well, took good games. And then I travelled down to Essex on the minibus, tore my calf in the warm-up again. Um, so that kind of wrote off that whole second season. First season, only picked up one injury. We did really well. We won a lot. Second season, that's when uh, I tore them uh, back to back my calves. And that's when they made the decision to retire. Um, I just got to the point, 2015, I think it was, where I always said to myself, just, and I said this to when I was younger, and, you know, I told my mum when I was like 15, 16 and my family, I'm never going to be a player who just takes money just to just to say I'm playing. I never I never wanted to do that. You know, I never thought. Um, I always wanted to give back as well. I don't I don't want to take money off a club. You know, for no reason. Even though you know you, you want the money, but I fell out of love with playing. Uh, I felt my skill set had got worse. I wasn't on the court. My confidence had started to really really drop. I, I didn't feel part of the culture anymore. Uh, from being this player, I just felt like I had a lot of bad luck with Mike, you know, in France, my agent, uh, through the stuff that happened in uh, the other part of France where teams, you know, last minute things changed, so my injuries. It kind of become a cycle where there was a lot of negativity happening and a lot of it wasn't really my fault as well. Like if, if I made my own bad decision, like, listen, you know, I'd, I've had bad relationships with people or, you know, I'd done stuff. It, 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 there wasn't any of that. It was just, uh, It was just like bad luck. And unfortunately, then I I got to the point where I'm working full time. I need the money. You know, you're not getting paid top money to, to play. So I had to make a decision, you know, what was best for me. Um, I still wanted to play, but I felt like my body, I just, I didn't want to go through rehabbing and doing this or 
I made the t- decision to step away from the game. Just said, you know, I don't want to play anymore. Uh, I don't enjoy it. Um, I, it. It came to a point where it felt like a chore. Yeah. You know, I I, I, I used to love to, to practice game days, packing my bag a certain way. Like Each athlete has their own little thing. I used to dread game day. I started to wake up, you know, and it was like, oh dear, I've got, got, because I'm working, you know, I was working seven till uh, three. Then I'm coaching at Severian, four till six. Then I'm going game film for an hour. Then I'm practicing eight till 10. My days are very long, you know, and then my weekends are taken up by traveling. Um, and then when injuries pick up, I'm in pain when I was working. It just, it, it, the, the cons outweighed the pros. Yeah. massively you know for me um, and it really hurt you know it hurt my family as well you know they were not disappointed in me or anything like that they were very disappointed that I didn't fulfill my potential because I was I thought I was one of the best guys in the country at the time I was playing really well I was tough uh, and I just thought I was I was getting to a peak and then just bad luck after bad luck after bad luck um, and then two months later I had that car crash cast I don't even remember when I was in order I had that bad car crash and that wiped me out again for six months and then I was just definitely I was like listen I'm Completely done. And at that point, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, at that point, when after that, coaching, were you thinking that might be a path to take, or how did how did that then come about? 